All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking around for my talk. Uh, I really love getting to end a long day of conference talks by just telling you a story. And that's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm just going to invite you to sit back and listen and enjoy the talk. I've been told that it's impossible to take notes on my talks or even to live tweet them at times. So feel free to just sit back and, and relax. Um, my name is Nicholas Means. I lead engineering at SIM, where we're building tools for composing secure access workflows that make sense and work with the tools that you already use. So if the idea of managing just-in-time access and privilege escalation via Slack, or even allowing on-call engineers to self-approve their own access during incidents, all with streaming audit log events, sounds useful to you, I'd love to tell you more. And thanks to everyone at SIM for holding down the fort this week so that I could be here. Now, before I get started, I want to start off with a brief content warning about this talk. This talk does contain stories of a couple of plane crashes, and one of them is pretty vivid. So if you are a nervous flyer, this talk might not be the right talk for you, and I'm not going to be offended in the slightest if you need to opt out at any point by walking out the back door. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I just want to make, make sure you all feel comfortable with that. Now, if you happen to follow me on Twitter, you might know that I'm occasionally in a plane spotting, especially when I'm traveling. I love seeing planes that I've never seen before, like this weird little Avro RJ85 I saw at London City Airport. It has four engines for reasons. The same number as a giant 747, even though it only carries about 100 passengers. Or special planes like Concorde BOAB that's just hanging out on the tarmac at London Heathrow for anybody to see as they taxi out. But I also really like identifying planes in the air. It's a bit of a game to me to be able to figure out what something flying overhead is and then pull up Flight Radar 24 and check and see if I'm right. And one of the ones that I learned to identify the most reliably is the 737. It's the best-selling aircraft of all time, and so it's everywhere. And once you know the trick, it's actually really easy to identify these planes in the air. The 737 has no doors over its rear landing gear. So if you see two black tires sticking out of the bottom of a plane, and it's too big to be a regional jet, you're looking at a 737 every time. And you can see on this one coming in for landing how the gears swing outward from the wheel-shaped cavities in the center of the fuselage. So, why are we talking about plane spotting? Well, there's an interesting reason that the 737 doesn't have landing gear doors. And that reason has everything to do with the problems with the 737 MAX. We get the first hint of a problem with the crash of Lion Air 610 in, off the coast of Indonesia on October 29th, 2018. This is the Boeing 737 MAX 8, registration number PK-LQP, that would operate Lion Air Flight 610 that morning. In this picture, the plane is at Boeing's Everett Washington delivery facility. This picture was taken in August 2018, just before the plane left on its final delivery voyage to Indonesia. Now, that means that this plane was approximately two months old on the day of the accident, basically still brand new, probably still had that new plane smell. The captain for Flight 610 was Bavier Suneja, an experienced pilot with over 6,000 hours of flying experience, most of them in the 737. In the right-hand seat that morning was Harvino, who went by just the one name, a common practice in Indonesia, another experienced pilot with almost as many hours as Sunesia, so it's an experienced flight crew. And Flight 610 was scheduled domestic service from Jakarta to Pengkol Penang in Indonesia, departing at 6.20 in the morning, and scheduled to arrive 50 minutes later, so just a little short hop, not a long flight at all. And the easiest way to tell the story of Lion Air 610 that will probably be comfortable to all of us in this room especially is through data. This is the transcription of, flight, of telemetry data from the plane's flight data recorder from the Indonesian NTSC accident report. And it actually tells a really clear story, so let me walk you through it. To get you oriented, the timestamps at the bottom here are helpfully all one minute and 19 seconds apart, the result of dividing the flight into 10 equal parts instead of the roughly 12 minutes that it lasted. And let me give us some more legible labels as well so we can tell what all of this data is. And let's start with the moment the plane gets airborne. So, Looking at this, there's a couple of things that immediately indicate that the plane's got a problem. First, as soon as the plane's in the air, the pilot's stick shaker starts shaking. Now, this is exactly what it sounds like, a vibration motor that literally shakes the yoke that the pilot is holding onto. It's the plane's most urgent warning mechanism on the flight deck, and it's there to really get the pilot's attention when the plane is about to stall. Now, in this context, as you may already know, stalling has nothing to do with the engines. It's referring to the wings and their ability to generate lift. When a wing is moving too slowly or too steeply through the air, vortices form on top of the wing, disrupting the smooth airflow that generates lift. Now, obviously, losing lift on your wings is a bad thing in an airplane, so when the plane senses it's at risk of this happening, it kicks on the stick shaker. It gives the pilot a very dramatic warning. 
But this plane has just lifted off the ground, and it's climbing smoothly. So why does the plane think it's about to stall? Even stranger, why is it only the pilot's stick shaker that's going off? In an actual stall, you would expect both stick shakers to be going off at the same time. And the answer to both questions is a few lines down the chart. The angle of attack indicated on the pilot's instruments is about 20 degrees greater than on the co-pilot's. Now, what's angle of attack? It's the angle at which the plane is moving through the air, and critically, it doesn't always follow the nose of the plane. Approaching a stall, the nose could be pointed up at the sky, but the plane actually moving parallel to the ground. And angle of attack is the way that you would tell, one of the ways that you can tell that this is what's happening. The plane senses angle of attack using a vane on each side of the aircraft, which I've highlighted, with each vane feeding the instruments on that side of the flight deck. So there's one on the pilot side for the pilot's instruments, one on the co-pilot side for the co-pilot instruments. And on flight 610, the pilot's vane was malfunctioning, reading about 20 degrees steeper than the co-pilot's. And if you look at this graph, the disagreement starts when the plane is still on the ground before it's even started moving, and it lasts the entire flight. They're 20 degrees different the whole flight. And so when it does take off, the plane immediately thinks that it's stalling, at least on the pilot's side. Now about two minutes into the flight, Harvino asks air traffic control for clearance to some holding point. The controller quick, quickly vectors the plane, gives them directions, and then asks for a reason to which he responds, flight control problem. He doesn't declare an emergency yet, though. About a minute later, having reached their hold point, Suneja becomes concerned about their flaps, the wing extensions that generate extra lift at low speeds. He'd been ignoring them, but now he notices that they're going too fast to have the flaps extended, and so he retracts them. Almost immediately, the plane plunges 700 feet uncommanded. Now, if you're a roller coaster fan, this is about three times the main drop of a modern steel hypercoaster. It would have been a pretty dramatic drop if you were in the back of the plane. You would have noticed it. Uh, and Suneja finds himself pulling back on a suddenly very heavy yoke, and he has a pretty good idea of what's happened. The plane's out of trim. And sure enough, there is a major nose down change in trim reflected in the data. So, what is trim? Well, let's take a look at the tail of a 737. At the back of the plane is this sort of mini wing called the horizontal stabilizer, and at the back of the horizontal stabilizer is the elevator. This is the control surface that responds when the pilot pushes or pulls the yoke to, to tilt the attitude of the plane up or down to ascend or descend. But it would be really exhausting if the pilot had to pull back on the control column for the entire climb phase of the flight, and that's where trim comes in. If you look at the front of the horizontal stabilizer, you can see a metal track there. The entire horizontal stabilizer, this whole mini wing, can angle up or down, and this is what trim adjusts. It serves as a sort of attitude cruise control for climbs and descents so that the pilot doesn't have to push or pull on the yoke the whole time. Now, for some reason, the plane's auto trim had made a pretty dramatic adjustment to pitch the nose of the plane down. You can see that here in yellow, that, that little dip down. And Suneja quickly provides a manual trim adjustment in blue to pull the nose back up. But a few seconds later, auto trim kicks in again to pitch the plane back down. Now, in aviation, there's an unwritten rule that when you make a change to the configuration of a plane and the plane does something that you don't understand, you undo that change. And then you take the time to figure out what's going on. So that's what Suneja does. He doesn't understand why the auto trim is kicked in, but he extends the flaps again and hopes that the auto trim will stop. And it does. There are a few routine adjustments, but no more dramatic drops. But Suneja is still worried about those flaps. He's still intending on completing this flight, and he knows that he can't do that with his flaps extended. And so he tries again. He retracts the flaps another time. And almost immediately, he's back to fighting the auto trim. Now, about this time, Harvino asks air traffic control for a return to Jakarta. The return's granted, but there's a few things that are strange about this. First, Harvino still doesn't declare an emergency. He's still treating this like an ordinary flight. Second, the controller doesn't even ask if 610 wants to declare an emergency. Instead of getting other planes out of the way and letting 610 focus on flying, Air traffic control keeps giving them turns around other traffic that complicate the work that Suneja is doing trying to keep the plane in the air. Suneja would keep fighting the plane for the next six minutes while Harvino scoured the flight manual for something, anything, that might explain what's going on and how to fix it. For every auto trim and activation, Suneja would counter with an equal burst of manual trim. The trim, despite oscillating up and down, would average out to mostly even over the six minute period. Suneja was doing a remarkable job and altitude would even be even as well. He was having to fight like hell, and it would have been terrifying to be in the back of the plane going up and down in 100 and 200 foot bursts, but Suneja is more or less keeping the plane at 5,000 feet. So finally, not sure what else to do with the beleaguered plane, Suneja hands the controls over to Harvino so that Suneja can dig through the flight manuals himself to see if he can find anything that his co-pilot may have missed. 
but he's so flustered at this point that he neglects to tell Harvino what he's been doing to keep the plane level. The auto trim continues to activate. Harvino counters with a couple of short bursts of manual trim adjustment, but not nearly enough to counter the auto trim. And in less than a minute, the plane has reached maximum nose down trim. Harvino's heard on the cockpit voice recorder at this point reciting a verse from the Quran asking God for a miracle. Suneja is pulling back on the yoke as hard as he can to try to pull the plane out of a dive, but it's too late. Flight 610 plunged 5,000 feet in 15 seconds, hitting the water at over 500 miles an hour and killing all 189 people on board. It was an absolute tragedy. The world, understandably, wanted to know what had happened, but the other airlines flying the 737 MAX needed to know what had happened and if it could happen to their brand new 737 MAXs as well. And so eight days later, Boeing would send its first message to the plane's operators, but it really doesn't say much. Basically, just that the early information about Lion Air 610 indicated that there was an uncommanded nose down trim as a result of a malfunctioning angle of attack sensor. The only problem with this statement is that there was no documented system on the 737 MAX where an angle of attack sensor could trigger nose down trim. And this bulletin didn't clear that up at all. Boeing got so many questions from operators that four days later, they sent out another operator message. And this message contained the first public acknowledgement of the now infamous Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. This was the system that was responsible for the uncommanded trim on Lion Air 610, and if you followed the 737 MAX story at all, you've probably at least heard of it. So what is MCAS? Well, to answer that, we need to know a little bit about the history of the 737. The 737 was launched by Boeing in 1967, 54 years ago. Commercial aviation was still fairly new, and airlines wanted access to markets beyond the big cities with their large airports. This meant flying into smaller airfields that might not have jet bridges or baggage handling equipment. And so because of that, the 737 was built low to the ground so that ground crews could load and unload baggage by hand without a conveyor or even a stepladder. You can just reach into the plane and pull suitcases out. And as you may have already figured out, this is why the 737 doesn't have rear landing gear doors. There's just not room for them. It's too low to the ground. This low clearance became a challenge as engine technology evolved. In the early 1980s, when Boeing wanted to update the 737's original low bypass engines with newer, more efficient high bypass turbofans, they had to find a way to fit the much larger engines under the wings. This strange looking, almost egg-shaped engine inlet is, is the result of that. If you've ever wondered why the engine inlet on a 737 is not round, this is why. They used the same solution in the mid 90s, 15 years later, to create the 737 next gen. In addition to updating the flight, the, updating from manual to electronic displays on the flight deck, the 737NG squeezes a slightly more efficient engine under the wing using similar but not quite as dramatically flattened inlets. But the low clearance went from engineering challenge to real problem in 2011. A year prior, in 2010, Airbus had introduced the Airbus A320neo. Now the A320 is the 737's closest competitor, carrying roughly the same 180 or so passengers on roughly the same routes. The Neo, short for new engine option, was the first major revision of the A320 since its launch. It incorporated new CFM LEAP engines with a much higher bypass ratio that resulted in nearly 20% fuel savings versus the older A320, and critically, the 737NG as well. Now, Boeing had long disregarded the competitive threat posed by Airbus, and that continued with the NEO. Boeing was planning on designing a brand new plane from scratch for the 180 seat market, and it assumed that it cut its current customers would continue buying the 737NG until the new plane was ready. Boeing CEO James McNerney got a rude awakening, however, in a phone call from American Airlines CEO Gerard Arpey. American was preparing to make its largest ever aircraft order, 400 planes in all, to replace its aging fleet of McDonnell Douglas MD-80s. Now McNerney thought that the deal was a shoe in because American's modern fleet was entirely Boeing. That was until RP called to let him know that American's first 200 planes would be a mix of A320s and 320 Neos from Airbus. It was a real kick in the pants for Boeing. But there was good news. Boeing could still compete for the other half of the order, but American wanted the same fuel economy as the A320neo, and it wanted it on the same five-year timeline that Airbus had promised. And to fully understand Boeing's response, we have to go further back to 1997, when Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas, another American aircraft manufacturer. Boeing, led by CEO Phil Condit, had long been an engineering company, with airplane people all the way to the top, including Condit himself, who's a trained engineer. McDonnell Douglas, on the other hand, was led by Harry Stonecipher, 
a graduate of Jack Welch's GE, heavily focused on maximizing shareholder value. StoneCypher came into Boeing as president and COO after the merger, and he made his influence quickly felt. Boeing became much more focused on margins and stock price. And StoneCypher also convinced Condit and the board to move Boeing headquarters from Seattle to Chicago. And he did this as a means of culture change, to give the executives in making business decisions some insulation from the engineers in Seattle who might push back on those decisions. When Condit resigned as CEO in 2003 with StoneCypher taking over, StoneCypher had this to say in an interview. When people say I changed the culture of Boeing, that was the intent, so that it's run like a business rather than a great engineering firm. Now, this sounds innocuous enough on the surface, right? But this culture change had resulted in a growing win-at-all-costs environment inside of Boeing. Condit's resignation was actually a result of this, forced out by stolen competitor documents and violations of government procurement laws that happened on his watch in an effort to increase the bottom line. McNerney, who took over from StoneCypher in 2005 after StoneCypher's own ethical lapse, was cut from the same GE cloth. With Boeing's 787 Dreamliner project suffering from manufacturing delays and battery problems, the 737 was the only plane Boeing was delivering in any significant volume in the early 2010s. Boeing's stock price was already down because of the problems with the 787. They were all over the news. Americans threatened defection to Airbus would drag the stock price even lower, and Boeing was worried that it might inspire other airlines to go to Airbus as well. McNerney wasn't about to let that happen. And so three months later, the 737 MAX was born. Designing it was a frantic project inside Boeing with engineers working at double their normal pace. Boeing made some aerodynamic improvements and spec'd the exact same CFM Leap engines as the 320neo, matching it on fuel efficiency. And their gambit worked. American ordered 737 MAXs to fill the rest of its order, 200 planes, but with one condition. The MAX had to be type rated with the current 737NG, meaning pilots who were qualified to fly the NG wouldn't need expensive simulator training to fly the MAX. American was already spending a bunch of money to train a bunch of its pilots to fly Airbus planes. They didn't want to spend more money training them to fly a new 737 as well. Southwest placed an order with the same condition, but they made it even stronger, insisting on a $1 million rebate per plane if pilots needed simulator training to be able to fly it. Now, CFM leaf engines, like I mentioned earlier, get their efficiency from a higher bypass ratio. And that, what that means is more space around the compressor core of the engine so that more air can flow around it. And that means that CFM leap engines are bigger, a lot bigger. Common type rating wasn't a challenge for Airbus. It could just swap the new engine in with, with few other major changes. But because of how low the 737 sits to the ground, it wasn't nearly so straightforward for Boeing. Even with a sculpted inlet, the leap would be too large to fit under the 737's wing. And so Boeing just worked around it. You can see here that instead of trying to fit the engine under the wing, they just stuck it out on the front of the wing. They moved the engine completely out from under it. And this gave them plenty of room for the bigger engine. It's a really clever workaround. But like most workarounds, it has drawbacks. They discovered a problem in early wind tunnel testing where in climbing steep bank turns when the plane was close to stalling, the pressure that the pilot felt on the yoke didn't match earlier 737 models because of the extra lift generated by the higher and further forward placement of the engines. Now, this was a scenario that a passenger plane would almost never find itself in, but it is required for certification, and critically, the plane's behavior needs to match for common type rating. Now, some engineers within Boeing abdicated for an aerodynamic fix, actual physical changes to the plane, but that would have delayed the project by months, and they didn't want that. So instead, they reached for a new software solution they just added to a different plane, the KC-46. MCAS was created for the KC-46 an air-to-air -air refueling tanker, and it was designed to keep the plane's handling characteristics consistent as it offloaded its fuel cargo and the plane's center of gravity change. That's what MCAS was originally designed to do. On the 737 MAX, MCAS would adjust trim by 0.6 degrees, just a smidge, nose down, just enough to make it mimic the control feel of prior 737s. And it was at this point that Boeing made a critical decision. The FAA has long delegated non-critical parts of airplane certification to employees of the manufacturers themselves, focusing the FAA's scarce resources on digging into safety-critical systems. Because of how rarely MCAS was expected to kick in and how small the adjustments were, Boeing categorized potential MCAS failure as hazardous, but not catastrophic, and those are the technical terms. That distinction allowed Boeing to self-certify the feature. And it also let Boeing drive its operation with a single angle of attack sensor rather than the redundancy required for systems with catastrophic failure potential. 
But Boeing's test pilots would later find another problem with the 737 once they got it into the air. Now, we talked earlier about stalls when the wing of the plane loses lift. In previous versions of the 737, low speed stalls are pretty dramatic with lots of buffeting vibration on the control column as the plane approaches a stall and a quick 30 degree drop of the nose once the stall actually happens, once the wings lose lift. When the MAX stalls, because of the power and placement of the engines, it was much less dramatic. There was still a little bit of buffeting, not as much, but the nose just gently tipped down by about 10 degrees. This handling difference would absolutely keep the MAX from achieving a common type rating. And so Boeing reached for MCAS again. But this time, instead of a 0 0.6 degree activation, they need to have MCAS quickly add 2.5 degrees of nose down trim as the plane stalled to get that quick 30 degree drop. So they implemented it, and again, it worked great, making the MAX feel almost exactly like previous generations. But because MCAS had already been declared non-critical, and this activation was expected to only occur at low speeds when pilots had plenty of time to react to it, Boeing decided against updating the safety analysis documentation it had submitted to the FAA as part of the plane's certification. Boeing's chief technical pilot, Mark Fortner, was behind another of the most critical decisions about MCAS. Facing lots of internal pressure from company leadership around type rating, he suggested that MCAS be intentionally omitted from the 737 MAX's flight manual with the logic that it operated in the background along with other automatic trim adjustments and that pilots would never need to directly interact with it. And the FAA agreed with this categorization and they allowed the omission. But the FAA's agreement didn't take the new low speed stall activation scenario into account because again, Boeing hadn't updated the safety analysis. And something seemingly nobody took into account was the possibility of MCAS activating repeatedly. The maximum adjustment of a 737's trim is 4.7 degrees. So it would take just two MCAS activations to get to the maximum nose down trim if the pilot didn't counter it with a manual adjustment. What's more, MCAS would pause for just five seconds after every manual trim adjustment before kicking back in. All of Boeing's analysis that it passed on to the FAA was based on a single activation. And it assumed that a pilot would be able to spot and address an erroneous activation in three seconds. And the reason for this assumption was that MCAS activation is remarkably similar to another control problem that pilots drill for runaway trim. In a runaway trim situation, the auto trim of the plane starts adjusting trim to one extreme and it doesn't stop. When this happens, these two wheels start spinning. These are the manual trim adjustment wheels and they have white markings on them specifically so that you can see them spinning. They'd spin about 40 times in a 2.5 degree MCAS activation and even more in a runaway trim scenario. You would see and hear them moving so quickly. And when this happens, recovery should be relatively straightforward. First, the pilot turns off the two stab trim cutout switches, disabling the electrical stabilizer trim of the plane and reverting the trim to complete manual control. Second, the pilot pulls back on the yoke to get the plane flying level again. And then third, the pilot uses the manual trim wheels to set the plane back into trim for level flight and gradually releases their pressure on the yoke as the trim starts reducing the pressure. Now we know Captain Sunajan knew he had a trim problem on Lion Air 610, because he repeatedly countered MCAS's nose down adjustments with manual nose up trim. So why didn't he or the co-pilot hit the stab trim cutout switches? Well, pilot and, activation and aviation journalist William Longavisha argues in his New York Times Magazine article that it comes down to pilot training. Specifically, because of the rapid rise of global aviation, there are more flight decks to fill than pilots to fill them. Airlines like Lion Air have had to scale up their own pilot training academies in-house and train pilots in a hurry just to keep up with growth. Longavish's assertion is that pilots trained this quickly learn by rote rather than experience and graduate knowing how to do the steps to fly a plane, but not what to do when things go out of a, outside of a certain narrowly defined set of situations. And the stunning 95% graduation rate of Lion Air's training academy would seem to back up this lack of rigorous training. As would the fact that Indonesia, with one of the fastest growing aviation sectors in the world, has 15 times more passenger fatalities per million flights than the global average. Now, the global average is incredibly low, so this is still not a huge number, but it's a notable difference. And so the theory goes that because the situation presenting itself to Sunej and Harvino didn't precisely match anything they'd been trained in, because MCAS pulsed on and off instead of being continuous like runaway trim, they didn't have the base aviation knowledge or instincts or pattern matching to know what to do. The situation would repeat itself less than five months later on Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. Now, notably, this is after Boeing published the bulletins on MCAS, so the pilots should have been fully aware. 
Again, a malfunctioning angle of attack sensor meant that the pilot stick shaker was operating the whole flight, and MCAS kicked in again as soon as the pilots retracted flaps. The Ethiopian pilots actually hit the stab trim cutout switches, but they had to turn electric trim back on because there was too much aerodynamic force on the horizontal stabilizer for them to adjust it by hand. As soon as they turned the stabilizer, electric stabilizer trim back on, MCAS kicked in again, and before they had time to counter it, the plane hit the ground, again killing everybody on board. The second crash led to the worldwide grounding of the 737 MAX fleet, and scenes like this of undelivered 737 MAX planes parked at the Boeing plant in Renton, Washington. So, why did this happen? Was it Boeing's fault for the way they added MCAS to the 737 MAX? Or the FAA's fault for not more closely certifying it? Was it the pilot's fault for not recognizing and recovering from the MCAS problem? Or does it go all the way back to the Boeing-Douglas merger and the resulting culture change at Boeing? Well, in her fantastic book, Thinking in Systems, Donella Meadows gives us some great tools to pick this situation apart using systems thinking. In the book, Meadows introduces the concepts of stocks and flows. Stocks are the foundational units of a system, the things that you can count or measure. They move slowly, taking time to react to changes in the system. Flows are the things that increase or decrease those stocks, and she uses the analogy of water in a bathtub as a stock, with the spigot filling the tub and the drain being the flow that, that can decrease that stock. There are feedback loops in the system that affect the rate of flows and a whole bunch of other things. The modeling rabbit hole can go pretty deep, so we'll keep this simple, famous last words. The stock that we're gonna consider in this system is safety. Now, it's hard to quantify, but the, the bathtub analogy sort of makes sense in that there's things that make safety in the system go up and things that make it go down. So let's add those. The clouds are the boundary of the system we're considering. We're not actually gonna think about where safety comes from and goes to, but instead, what affects the rate of increase and decrease of safety in the system? This is because rather than being static one-time events, the things that affect safety in a system tend to have cumulative ongoing effects. We're never gonna be able to get rid of everything that decreases safety in the system, so the goal is to keep the rate of increase high enough to make up for any decrease that we have to incur. Now let's start with pilot training. We know that the desire to preserve safety in the system positively drives the quality of pilot training, and that quality pilot training increases the flow of safety in the system. But we also know that the increasing safety of air travel has been a major factor in increasing the amount of air travel and that more air travel means more pilots are needed, and that demand for pilots negatively impacts training quality, driving a decrease in safety. The increased amount of travel also increased the number of planes needed by airlines every year, and this has a few effects. First, it has a positive influence on the rate of technological advance because more planes sold makes it easier to recoup those investments, and by and large, those advances have a positive influence on safety. The increasing number of planes needed also created an economic environment ripe for consolidation because there were opportunities for cost savings and volume. This consolidation caused, among other things, dilution of Boeing's culture of engineering excellence. And the level of safety in the system contributed to this, making it feel safe to dial back engineering excellence just a bit in the name of profit. And we know from earlier that this drove a decrease in safety. Third, the increase in planes needed in the market increased competitive pressure. Boeing had to play catch up with Airbus. That put pressure on Boeing to increase design speed. And again, they felt safe doing this because of the safety already in the system. But we know this reduced design quality and that in turn decreased the safety of the system. And finally, from a regulatory perspective, the amount of safety already in the system made it possible for Congress to tell the FAA to increase the amount of certification delegation that it was doing. That meant, among other things, missing the change to MCAS clearly decreasing safety. Now if you'll notice, every feedback loop in this diagram is rooted in the safety in the system already. So what does that mean? That the safety in the system caused the problems with the 737 MAX? Well, actually in a way, yes. In the intro to thinking in systems, Dr. Meadows says, everyone or everything in a system can act dutifully and rationally, yet all these well-meaning actions too often add up to a perfectly terrible result. And that's what happened here. Every actor in the system, buoyed by the safety of modern aviation, borrowed a little bit from safety to optimize something else. It goes back to what Casey was saying this morning about exposure to risk being required to build resiliency. Nobody at Boeing or the FAA set out to build an unsafe airplane, but the growing infrequency of aviation accidents caused them to lose perspective. And the cumulative effect of their actions in the system was tragedy.
So what should we take away from this? Well, given that we're at SRECon, it's likely that most of us in this room have some experience with systems thinking. Gravitating towards this kind of thinking is likely part of how most of us got here in the first place. SRE is very much a systems thinking oriented discipline. But we're all so busy. How often do we actually make the time to stop and think about any of the complex socio-technical systems that surround us to really understand the behavior that we're seeing? We so often unintentionally shortcut our way through, the un through understanding the full system, focusing instead on individual problems and single feedback loops. And when we do this, we risk missing the broader reasons that something's happening, or even introducing negative side effects we never intended or anticipated. And that's what I want to leave you with today. You, you have to make time to think in full about the systems around you, to understand them deeply, because you don't know what you might uncover. Some of the concepts most important to us, like human factors and resiliency and generative culture, emerged from people who took the time to break down systems and really understand them, making the software world a better place along the way. And if you're like me, you sort of learn how to do systems thinking by watching and imitating other systems thinkers. Uh, Dr. Meadows' book is a great primer on the formal discipline of systems thinking. It's definitely worth picking up to invest in your skills in this area and increase your effectiveness. Let me leave you on a positive note about the 737 MAX as well. Systems tend to be adaptive and interested in their own survival. And that's definitely true here. In the wake of the two crashes during the grounding of the MAX, a few things have happened. First, the decrease in safety in the system caused Congress and the FAA to rethink its approach to delegation. Specifically, manufacturers can no longer self-certify a novel or unusual design feature. And the FAA now has to approve the individuals that manufacturers delegate certification authority to. This should increase safety in the system. The crash has also had an impact on design speed and quality at Boeing, both directly and indirectly via changes to FAA delegation and certification scrutiny. The MAX was grounded for one year and eight months while Boeing revised it, taking the time they likely should have in the initial design phase to get things right. Other problems with software and wiring were found along the way and fixed in the course of recertification, clearly improving safety. The version of MCAS now active on the MAX can only activate once in a stall event and only if the pilot and co-pilot angle of attack sensors agree. And finally, the crashes pointed out that pilots actually do need simulator training to safely fly the 737 MAX, a positive impact on training quality, further increasing the safety in the system. Now, odds are that more than one of you here is flying home on a 737 MAX. Now, if that's you, you shouldn't worry. I didn't fly one on this trip, but I did fly one less than a month ago, and I'll happily fly one again. The MAX has gotten so much scrutiny at this point that it might be one of the safest planes in the air. And as you go, best of luck digging deeper into the systems all around you so that you can influence them for good. You might even stumble across something important in your journey that makes all of our jobs easier. And I hope that we'll see you on stage in the future to tell us that story. Thanks so much for coming.